sigan a la gente de la Trifulca. Saludos, este que te habla es el hijo del enigma y les exhorto a que sigan a mis amigos de Trifulca Racing Podcast. Este que le habla es Baroness de Shoe. Y los invito a que sigan lo que es Trifulca Wrestling Media. El luchador más completo que tiene Puerto Rico, The White Shadow, Mark Davidson. Y es para soltar a cada uno de ustedes a que sintonicen y sigan en todas sus plataformas la Trifulca Wrestling Podcast. Vaya saludos a toda la fanática de la Trifulca Wrestling Podcast. Este que le habla es Mr. Blue, Rodrigo Peligro así hacer es. Bienvenidos al mundo del Mesías, la crema de la crema, de la crema de la lucha libre, el papá de los pollitos. Saludos a todos los fanáticos de Trifurca. Así que sigan en sintonía los mejores haciendo entrevistas y podcasts. Y si tienen algún problema con ellos, ustedes me avisan que yo les llego a cada país donde yo estén y los llevo al fondo de la vida. Posca que sabe entrevistar a verdaderos luchadores como yo. Porque yo represento lucha libre. Un poco que está dando aquí hablar en todo Puerto Rico, sin lugar a dudas, uno de los mejores en toda la vida. Que vaya, estén pendientes a las redes sociales de la Trifulca Racing Poca. Y recuerden algo: que yo soy Mr. Bill Rodrigo Peligro Vacía. Y ustedes no. Bueno, aquí Android 787. En todas sus plataformas disponibles. Aquí encontrarás los mejores podcasts con y para tus luchadores favoritos. De Trifulca Wrestling Media. Si quieren estar al tanto de todas las noticias de Lucha Libre aquí en Puerto Rico o mundial. ¿Ustedes saben por qué? Porque este hombre que está ahí, ese hombre que está ahí, y yo, reímos mejor. No hay más nada que hablar. La Trifurca Wrestling Media. Así que no se lo pierdan. El Mesías, Ricky Banderas. ¿Les guste o no? ¿Les guste? Oye, oye, oye. Alex Torres junto a Mari Geraldo. Y bienvenido a un nuevo episodio de la Trifulca Wrestling Podcast Interviews. Nuestra próxima invitada es una colega del Wrestling Media. Ella es súper conocedora de la lucha libre mundial. Es más, se la ha hecho a cualquiera en este tema de la lucha libre. El que quiera hablar de lucha libre contra alguien, she's the right person to talk to. La pueden escuchar semanalmente en the hashtag Miranda Show a través del website de shareshot.com y también en todos los apps de podcast al que es parte de la lucha libre, también Central, Central Podcast, la lucha, lucha Central Podcast también, ella es parte de los co-hosts, también lo pueden ver en el website de Lucha Central Podcast, le llaman The Ring Announcer of the Stars y la Queen of Soft Style, así que vamos a darle la bienvenida a Miranda Morales. Bienvenida, bienvenida. I'm used to doing introductions, so that was wonderful. Thank you. No, no, th thank you for the feedback. <laughs> Now, yeah, you're right because uh, you know I, I hear both of your post podcasts, and 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 you are the one who presents your co-host usually. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. That's part of of I I just get so used to that. It came kind of from my ring announcing side, where I was a ring announcer before I did podcasting. And, and that's just something I guess I always fall back on and I love to do, um, even when I don't have to. I love introductions. So that was great. Thank you. Cool, cool. Good to know. You're so, welcome. Um, so, Omar, uh, you can start <laughs> with the first question. Perfect. For how long have you been a fan of the wrestling? Oh, man. Yeah, I've been a fan since I was about 10 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, I, wow. Yes, I grew up in the late 90s, so I got to see right in the middle of the Monday Night Wars and the Attitude Era. Um, specifically, I started to watch during the storyline of Stone Cold Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels for WrestleMania 14. That was, that was great. That was great. That, that that whole story drew me because I love, and still one of my favorites, if not my favorite of all time, is Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I just loved that dynamic between him and Shawn Michaels and with adding Mike Tyson in. That was oh, yeah. a whole fun level. And wrestling at that time was just so over the top and ridiculous and, you know, so much going on. And I was also that kid flipping the channels between Monday Night Nitro and, and Raw because I I couldn't stop watching both but that storyline between Shawn Michaels and, and Stone Cold 
um, heading to WrestleMania 14 was the storyline that got me into to wrestling as a kid. And I just loved how they just didn't care. They were so badass. They were so cool. Uh, I loved the, the physicality of the wrestling, especially, you know, Stone Cold, who would just really, like, pounce on people in the middle of the ring. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like that, to me, I, and I don't, to be honest, I don't know necessarily know why. I just knew I liked it. I knew I wanted to see more of it. And then, you know, so many years later, the rest of my life, here I am. Uh, and I've been a fan in and out. There have been times where I kind of left wrestling and then I'd come back. But um, I, you know, always I think uh, it was it was something I always kind of kept my eye on and it was always a big interest of mine. So now that I'm mm. at this stage of life and get to do more with it, it means even more to me. You know, it's funny that you said that because uh, especially the part that, you know, there's you were saying that there's some times that you're off wrestling that, you know, you stop watching it, you know, it, you know, for me, that's pretty normal. Uh, if it wasn't for the podcast that we've been for a year, it, it, that kind of happens to me, you know, from Royal Rumble onto WrestleMania, even until SummerSlam, you keep track. I, I keep track on it for some reason after SummerSlam, I get a little bit bored and I stop like watching wrestling and then I get interest probably by the Survivor Series time frame. And then all the way for the Rumble, and then you're into it. But because of the podcast, you know, you know, uh, us that we're a media, we have no choice to keep watching wrestling all the time, even that you want to start, man. I don't want to know anything. 24-7 wrestling. <laughs> yeah. You know, but honestly... And there's so much wrestling, it literally is 24-7. You could spend a whole day and not watch anything. That's out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you sometimes you need vacation from wrestling and you, oh my god, I don't want to watch I want to watch, watch <laughs> basketball this week. How about that? <laughs> Geraldo. So you mentioned you grew up on the Monday Night Wars. Uh, other than WWE and WCW, uh, did you watch any other wrestling promotions uh, growing up? So I did get to watch a little bit of ECW when they were on TNT. So I didn't get to be that deep into ECW with the tape trading and all of that. So by the time they got to TNT, oh, I'm sorry, uh, TNN. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 TNN, you got it, TNN. Uh, to TNN. Well, I'm not uh, once they got <laughs> to TNN, um, that was really my first exposure to ECW. And that, too, I loved because, I um, mean, talk about physicality. That mm -hmm. show was brutal. <laughs> And the fact that they had even lightened it up from what, you know, they had had before prior to getting on TV, um, that I learned more about it after they, you know, they got bought by WWE. Um, and so that was something I was just getting into when, uh, and it was about that same time, too, uh, as a kid, because I, I know it was uh, uh, around the same time that the other shows were on, but uh, that was, that was a big one for me. Uh, I didn't really get to appreciate ECW until after it ended, really. And I think that's the case with a lot of fans. You don't really get to appreciate a lot of um, ECW and even a lot of some of the older promotions like MLW Now. I love MLW Underground mm -hmm. because I get to see what they were trying to do with MLW and kind of have take it uh, a tone very similar to ECW. So those things I just didn't know and realize as a kid because I didn't do that much digging into other wrestling outside of what was on TV. Um, but ECW is one that um, one of the very first DVDs that I bought of wrestling was the rise and fall of ECW. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was mm -hmm. obsessed, obsessed with that um, because I really loved the story and finding out more about what was happening behind the scenes and how some of the best wrestlers in the world came through ECW. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a very special place for ECW in my heart. You know, I remember when I started watching ECW, you know, this is back in 95 or 96, my dad used to have this big uh, dish in the roof to, to you know, it's it, it before Dish Network, it was this uh -huh. big pair of... Uh, satellite, uh, satellite, well, yeah. The satellites, yeah. So I remember that in the in the live feed, he found this promotion at two or three a.m. in the morning, and and then 
you know, probably I was in eighth grade, so I, I started watching it with him, and he, he looked so, you know, by the time, it was so shocking because he was so hardcore, the blood and everything, and then weeks later, they would start showing in WWF. I remember they have, like, an angle uh, versus uh, Jerry the King, and then Jerry the King went to ECW yeah. and have yeah, that right, thing. Right. So, yeah. But, you know, when you see it for the first time, you say, oh, my God, this is something I never seen before. So, yeah, th that DVD was one of the best selling DVDs in the history of WWE by that time. And, and because of that, that, no, to, that was to, this day, to this day, it's actually the best uh, selling DVD. So basically, oh, wow. uh, yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, it's uh, it's still the best-selling DVD because of it. Because uh, as as you mentioned, a lot of people uh, actually found out about ECW after uh, it went out of business. So uh, yeah, a, a lot of people actually realized that ECW was around because of the DVD. So mm -hmm. no, you're right. So so Miranda, uh, so now you you already told us you know why you start watching on TV where you were growing up. What about live events? Do you get to go to live events in, when you were growing up? I really didn't. So I grew up in a small town called Yuma, uh, Arizona, and okay. it is right on the uh, Arizona California border. Very very small town, and so we didn't really get to have shows come through. Um, it wasn't until I was in a period where I wasn't watching where WWF at the time did come through and, and they had a show there. But at that time, I was in high school and I wasn't really watching. So it wasn't until I went to college and I finally got the chance to go to wrestling shows. Uh, I think that my very first one was a house show um, in about 2005. And I'm living in Tucson, Arizona now. They had a house show here. Um, and it was my very first live event, and it, I was just kind of uh, just in shock that I finally was able to do that as an adult. Um, I think it would have been different if I went as a kid. I think I would have uh, had such a different experience because I mm -hmm. see kids who go to live events, and it's magical for them. I mean, they are seeing their heroes, you know, live. They're they get to see something that is on TV every week that looks so larger than life. To be there as a kid, I can only imagine how amazing it is. But it's still really fun as an adult. You kind of are able to enjoy uh, what what it is and what it's not. You know, you can kind of poke fun at things. And so um, since I've been an adult, I've been able to go to a lot of WWF live events um, just as a fan. Um, and then this past January, I mm -hmm. went to my first Impact event. Um, as as part of the media for Hard to Kill, and that was that, so cool. was, that was something else uh, to go to my very first Impact show and to do that uh, as part of the Chairshot.com was amazing because we got to interview some of the wrestlers and have a, a, a press day with them, but then also to watch that event live as someone from the media, it's a totally different experience because you're analyzing things more, you're taking pictures, like in some ways you don't get to enjoy it in the same way because you're much more critical of what's happening in front of you instead of kind of just sitting back and watching mm -hmm. wrestling. And I'm sure you guys know that too. There's a difference when you are reviewing a, an event for the podcast or, or for you know your website being part of a news outlet compared to just watching something as a fan. It's very different. So that's, that's uh, been something that over the past few years I've kind of adjusted to. But I want to go to more. Uh, I, I want to go to an AEW event. I want to go to Ring of Honor. That was one, too. I, I was going to go in March when they were in Las Vegas, but they canceled due to yeah. COVID. So I didn't get the chance to go uh, to my first Ring of Honor event. But I'm, I'm still hoping. I'm still hoping that I can do that in the future. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that that, that happened to us, too. You know, uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, you know, uh, there's wrestling every weekend. Obviously, right now, they, they stopped the over there. They This, the wrestling didn't this didn't start yet. It stopped It's, from the pandemic. Mm, yeah. So from the since, start of the pandemic, they stopped mm, the wrestling, and, and, and we didn't still, have wrestling here. Mm, not, not yet. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, I was going to WrestleMania, and because of the situation, but obviously got canceled. You know, I was going 
from a, a fan point of view, but also I was gonna start do our first like live coverage with for our media. So it was kind of oh man. <laughs> oh, uh, it was hard. That's hard, especially WrestleMania. To I mean that that's that's a mm. that's the biggest show. To I've never gone to a WrestleMania myself. And uh, I was really hoping uh, to go to the one in, in California, in L.A., but it looks like that's not going to happen. So uh, yeah. I'll have to wait uh, another almost maybe a few years before a WrestleMania <laughs> comes out to this side of the country. Yeah, uh, because you are from you are from Arizona. I think the last big event was the Royal Rumble from last year, right? Yes, I did go to that. I did okay. go. It was the the twenty nineteen Royal Rumble, and that was amazing. Uh, that was the year that that started Becky Lynch's rise uh, to mm -hmm. the main event of WrestleMania. Getting to see her win the Royal Rumble, being a part of the crowd, not knowing what was going to happen with her was great. Um, seeing you know Brock Lesnar live and Balor, um, all of you know just the Royal Rumble is probably probably my favorite event. I mean, WrestleMania, I think, is, is one of the best ones, but out of the other kind of legacy pay-per-views, Survivor Series, SummerSlam, the Royal Rumble is pretty much, for me, better than all of them. So to, to yeah. go to a Royal Rumble uh, is a pretty good... Uh, yeah, be, you know, because you can, you, you can watch uh, other wrestlers that in WrestleMania you didn't, uh, you did not can watch because it's not a space to for every talent. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Every wrestler participate in Mania and Royal Rumble. You can put as much as wrestlers you can in in, in the mm -hmm. uh, in the event. Even the the girls now too. And, and and I agree with you. And I think the three of us we always said that Royal Rumble is our favorite pay per view yeah. as well. Yeah. Probably that was my, since I was a kid. You know my you know my first my favorite Royal Rumble is still the 1990 Royal Rumble. <laughs> so this this is my still my top. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, that's a good one. It's a good one. It has mm -hmm. big implications, you know. I mean, it's it's I think a fan favorite, so I get that. Yeah, yeah I think. Mm -hmm. How did you become a rain announcer? So uh, that was on the local level. At the time, I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I lived there for about seven years. Okay. And about what year was that? This was uh, 2017. Um, actually, the end of 2016, I uh, met a, a local promotion, Destiny Wrestling Organization in Albuquerque. They were at uh, our local Comic-Con, um, and they had a booth there to, you know, allow fans to meet uh, the wrestlers and to help promote their upcoming show. I've okay. been wanting to, to go to a Destiny Wrestling show because that was the first independent promotion I'd ever went to and saw a, a, a wrestling show. Uh, okay. Before that, I had only gone to WWE shows. So going to a local promotion show was a whole different experience for me, and I loved it. Um, I, I went up to the booth and started talking to the wrestlers and the promoter there, and um, they were looking for people who wanted to work for the promotion, kind of like an intern. Um, and okay. so... Uh, I said, okay, you know, I want to intern with you. <laughs> and so a few months later, at their first show of 2017, they had me do some backstage interviewing because they did, uh, they actually were on local television and put a lot of content online. So I started to do backstage interviews for them for a few months. And that was a lot of fun because uh, that was really my first exposure to interviewing wrestlers. And it's a totally different when you're doing it at a live show because uh, you have a short amount of time. You're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, get what you need to get, but you're also worried about the background noise happening in the ring. You know, you want to try and have the right setting. So it was definitely trial by fire um, with interviewing. But a few months later, they uh, had me start to ring announce. And I luckily, I was very fortunate. Not a lot of people get to do baby steps. A lot of people just get thrown into a situation. But okay. for me, they got they allowed me to announce one or two matches a show, um, and eventually I got to announce more and more matches um, with with Destiny Wrestling. And then eventually I moved back to Arizona. I, I grew up here, but I, I left and came back. 
and I started to work with Arizona Wrestling Federation, Cactus League Wrestling, Rockstar Wrestling Alliance all here, and I really got to do shows on my own. There was no more baby steps, just me announcing. So, uh, you know, that was the two. Announcing for different promotions, you kind of realize that they all have their different uh, styles and how they want to present things to the crowd and mm-hmm. what you can say and maybe what you can't say. Um, so that was a big learning experience for me. But um, it all started in, in Albuquerque and it's just continued to, to grow. I haven't had the chance to announce very much this year because of the pandemic and not, not having a lot of shows around. But I had some really cool experiences, again, kind of big first. Uh, back in March, right before the pandemic shut things down, I announced for Future Stars of Wrestling out of Las Vegas, and it was the biggest show I had ever announced for. I mean, it That's had so people cool. on that roster that you see all, all the time. I mean, Chris Bay from Impact Wrestling, Alexander Hammerstone from MLW, uh, Daga, Tessa Blanchard, um, cool. you know, I mean, uh, people that you, you see all the time, Willie Mack, mm. um, like it... It was the biggest show I ever announced for, and it was a cool milestone to kind of feel like you've come, like you've you've made it to a certain level of your career where you're able to announce for those people. And it may just be the last time I ever do something like that, but the fact that I got to do it was very, very cool. That is so cool. You know, you know, you start, you know, with with those a, a promotions that you were talking to us and then obviously before everything happens you know you get to 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 be a ring announcer for a big show that's so cool you know especially you know you you mentioned uh, wrestlers like tessa willie mag that's so cool that guy, probably yeah. have to, have to be nerve-wracking as well probably because you know <laughs> it might, I, will, i will be nervous yeah <laughs> yeah it really was it, it was on um the fight tv app so it was streamed Ooh. and so uh it was really it, it, it you know lots of people saw it there was a big crowd as well so it was it was yeah it, there's definitely an element to to it being nerve-wracking and there's some people that i've announced for that i've definitely gotten nervous before i've announced them um Sometimes it's because maybe their uh, introduction is a little complex and I want to make it right. Sometimes it's just because of who they are and I get, you know, really nervous of, oh my gosh, I'm about to announce, you know, this person. Like, Juventud Guerrero's announced, uh, his ring entrance was a little elaborate because he had very specific things that he wanted me to say. And then okay. you have also someone like, uh, or just like he is the... I even forgot. I have to see where it is, but he's the one, the juiciest one. Uh, and he had like a, a little bit of a long one. And then you have someone like Karrion Cross, who I was able to announce several times. And his presence as a wrestler is very intimidating. He is tall. He is like very focused. He comes into the ring with so much intensity that I just want to make sure I say what I need to say. I get it right. I don't mess it up. And I leave the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Geraldo. Other than the wrestlers you mentioned already, uh, which wrestlers uh, have you met uh, since you've been uh, in the in the industry? Yeah. Um. You know, it, it's been twofold. There's been some uh, amazing people I've gotten to announce for uh, through, you know, working with different promotions. Um, like I, I mentioned, some of, of the, the wrestlers I announced for back in March for Future Stars of Wrestling. Um, that was that was very, very cool. Um, and getting to meet uh, uh, more just like legends. One person, I didn't get to announce him, but met him. And he was a childhood hero. Uh, was um, Mick Foley. Mick Foley was one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. And the fact that I just got to meet him for just a second was something I never thought I, I would do. It was That's amazing. So cool. And he was so nice um, and easygoing. Talking to about um, ECW in Albuquerque. Our promotion was very tied into working with a lot of ECW legends. Um, and I had to, I did an interview with Tommy Dreamer and that was, you know, the 10 year old in me was freaking out, but mm -hmm. I got to do an interview with Tommy Dreamer. Um, and he was amazing. I mean, after the show, he really just did a great talk with everyone in the back 
and he really and it and for him he just started off by talking with one person and someone else hearing him and you know kind of moving closer to him and then the rest of the locker room started to get closer to the point where it was silent and it was just <laughs> Tommy talking um, and That's he was so talking cool. about you know uh, just the, the industry and, and how to support one another and, you know, how to watch out for each other. And at the end of his speech, you know, everyone started to clap. He didn't realize that everyone was listening to him at that point. Um, <laughs> and so that, that to me was something really special to not only see the person in front of the camera, but behind the scenes. And, and also the blue meanie. He was just so sweet and he's the best. And I just loved him. Um, his, his personality, happy-go-lucky, and he really was that as well. And he was just so nice and, and kind. Um, those people that I grew up watching for me was uh, amazing. Um, as far as on the interviewing side, I think the person that still I'm kind of shocked that I got the chance to interview, even just a little bit, was Lindsay Dorado. Um, oh, we did an interview nice. with him at Lucha Central, and he was amazing. He was just so nice and easygoing and incredibly talented and for me especially uh as a puerto rican watching television he's one of those uh wrestlers where i'm really proud of what he does and, and i'm proud that he represents the culture and i'm proud that you know he has a platform um and, he, and, and he's just always proud uh, of what he does and i just got to tell him that a little bit even though i didn't have to i just knew i would regret it if I didn't and he was just really understanding of that and I think for me that it's important to share with him because you know there's kids who watch him there's adults mm -hmm. you know and, and to have that representation on the TV and in the company um, to me is very important because we don't have that a lot uh, now more than ever though we have so much amazing representation but Lindsay has been with the company for so long and he does amazing things in and out of the ring that I just wanted to acknowledge that and just wanted to thank him for that because he's just doing him you know 100% and you know I, I, I always wish the best things for him because he's a, a really not only fantastic wrestler but an amazing person. And not so long ago, you, you interviewed Tenille Dashwood as well. So that was probably like a week ago or something like that. Yeah, that was uh, Impact Wrestling does a press pass call every week. It's recorded on Facebook and uh, they allow people from the media to ask questions to the talent. Two weeks ago, it was Tenille Dashwood and I got to ask her a question about stipulation matches. Um, and... She kind of threw the question back at me. I asked her if she was interested in doing a stipulation match ever because Impact Wrestling has been pretty big uh, on women doing stipulation matches way before WWE. Mm -hmm. You know, they had women in cage matches. They had them in hardcore matches. Yep. They, they really pushed the boundaries of women's wrestling for a long time. So I asked her if she would be interested in doing a stipulation match. She threw the question back at me saying, why would she want to do a stipulation match? Does she have anything to prove? That's what a lot of people, you know, usually want to do in a stipulation match is to prove themselves. And she felt like she had nothing to prove, which I totally got. I understood where she was coming <laughs> from. Uh, but I did say that usually in a stipulation match, you get to inflict more pain on your opponent. You get to do more. And, you know, that probably sounds like a good thing for her. She likes to inflict pain on people. So she ended up changing her mind by the end of the question. She was, you know, thinking about it. She didn't say a, a particular stipulation match she would be interested in. But I have a feeling if she would be in a stipulation match, it would be one that she would create. There you go. Yeah, I agree with you. So you have your own show right now, the Hashtag Miranda Show. That's part of the ShareShot.com. So... Talk, talk to us about that. You know how, how when the what when that starts. You know, yeah. it actually the the idea for the hashtag Miranda show started when I went to the 2019 Royal Rumble. I was there with my friend Greg DeMarco, who is the mm -hmm. uh, he runs the Chairshot.com. He also has his own podcast, the Greg DeMarco Show, and we were sitting there just talking about you know wrestling and everything in between. And he said, "Do you?" I think this would be good for a podcast. Do you want to do your own podcast? 
and I said, yeah, and, and that's how the show was born. Um, the name, the hashtag Miranda, came from the fact that I am not on Twitter. I'll keep cutting out. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're good. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, there's terrible connection out here on the West Coast. People make fun of me. I live in the middle of the desert, so that's why there's no <laughs> interception in the desert. There isn't. Uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, the, see, otra vez, what is, I'm telling you, the, it, or, or they're listening in, because that also happens, they listen into these podcasts, and so when they don't like what they hear, that's, that's when they start messing with no, the that's internet. That's when they start messing, yeah. <laughs> hey, so what, 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 can, what can you say? <laughs> well, don't worry, yeah, no, no, don't, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not on Twitter. So uh, the co-hosts of Greg's show, Greg and Patrick, they would um, tease me that I was not on Twitter. So they could never tag me when they were doing tweets. So they would have to use the hashtag Miranda. Um, okay. So they would hashtag oh. that. And so mm-hmm. uh, that that's kind of was my nickname for a while is the hashtag Miranda um, because I just and I still am not on Twitter. I don't have any plans to have a Twitter right now, uh, just because wrestling Twitter is something else. You guys know. You guys are on wrestling Twitter a lot. Um, you see what people, you know, put out there. Uh, some people get into arguments. Some people have lots of content out there. It, it's it's a lot. It's, it's the lot hardcore. Of- it's the hardcore <laughs> social media. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, Omar is right. <laughs> it's hard. It is hardcore. So. Uh, I'm just going to live in this other world of Facebook and Instagram for a little bit. But uh, yes, if, if anyone ever needs to tag me on social, on at least Twitter, they'll just have to use the hashtag Miranda. You, you know, to, to, you know, in, in our case, we have a Twitter account, you know, of, of the three food media. <laughs> but, we, you know, we basically what we do is we post on Instagram and I, and I go straight to Twitter. Copy That's and paste. It. Copy and paste. We, we, I, yeah. I don't know. I think good. that the, yeah, I think the only time that us as a media, you know, have like a a conversation or or, or a feedback is when you were covering uh, the takeover uh, on the past weekend, and I think we made a comment about the hijo del fantasma match, and I say yeah. something, and that was it. But probably that was the only time us as a media <laughs> write something from our own. Well, when you know you have good conversation, maybe that helps. I, I do sometimes take over the ChairShot's Twitter account, at ChairShot Media. The ChairShot does have its own Twitter account, and again, it was a kind of a brainchild of, of Greg, where I take over during a takeover. Um, and so I'll take over the Twitter account, and that's kind of my way of testing the waters of Twitter, mm-hmm. of getting to tweet without having the responsibility of an actual handle. And so I could do whatever I want and I'll just blame it on the chair shop. And they're, you know, they don't really have any other choice. So uh, I haven't done anything too embarrassing yet, but this is only about maybe the fourth time I've tweeted, done, done live tweets. So, you know, um, there's still a lot of room to, to mess things up. I'm trying to convince Geraldo, you know, to start putting some stuff stuff and on Twitter so we're, we're getting there right Omar so he have some <laughs> something a, a way of thinking about wrestling and life that we want him strongly <laughs> yeah strong words from Geraldo <laughs> yeah Yay! let's uh, let, let, let's see uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it so maybe in a few months maybe we'll, we'll start uh, I'll start doing that so. <laughs> <laughs> even, Omar. Yeah, even just the line a quote it sounds like you know words to live by um, I think it could catch on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh, my. Tell us about the Lucha Central podcast. Yeah, that is a newer project. Uh, I've been with uh, LuchaCentral.com now for a few months. Uh, LuchaCentral.com has kind of had this revamping um, this past year where they've, they've been around for quite a while, but they just recently launched the Lucha Central podcast network. Um, and now they have a huge amount of podcasts as part of their network, all focused on different elements of Lucha Libre and, and uh, wrestling, especially like uh, Southern California wrestling, which is very ingrained and embedded with, you know, Lucha Libre culture and, and style. 
Um, I got in connection with Kevin Kleinrock, who is, you know, the he is the kingpin of, of LuchaCentral.com and okay. Mass Republic. Mm-hmm. And um, they were looking for co- a host for the Lucha Central Weekly podcast. The unique thing about the Lucha Central Weekly podcast is that it's in English and Spanish. So there's an English team that does it, and then there's a Spanish broadcast team. So it's one of the, there's only about two or three podcasts on the entire network that are um, in Spanish. You have uh, Lucha Central Weekly in Espanol, um, La Mesa de los Magaros is the other mm-hmm. one. I mean, there's a, a third one as well, but um, our podcast, uh, myself, Brendan Barr, Dusty Murphy, we really just hit on the world of Lucha Libre. We talk about, especially now in, in the current culture and current times of wrestling, what things would someone who's interested mm-hmm. in Lucha Libre would want to know? Uh, where can they find Lucha Libre, especially in the American markets? Uh, and also trying to highlight what's happening in Mexico with CMLL and AAA, along with some of the other independents, IR, uh, IWRG, um, Lucha Libre Vanguardia. And mm-hmm. to me, that's been a huge... Talk about getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, learning and exploring the world of Lucha Libre, uh, I had some exposure to it as a kid with the WCW Cruiserweight division. That yeah. was the first time I really got to see it, and it's talk about beautiful times that's something i didn't appreciate as a kid was the cruiserweight division in wcw but now it's one of my favorite things when i go watch wcw episodes i'll skip over you know what the nwo was doing um and i'll specifically watch it for the cruiserweights no so every every week we just talk about what's happening with um luchadors in, in wwe aew uh mlw uh nxt uh we highlight and talk about events that's happening in mexico and we do a, a really cool segment called this week in lucha libre history and for me that's been one of the best learning points of this whole experience luchacentral.com does a, a article called this day in lucha libre history they'll cover certain events matches anniversaries title wins that you know are part of the the history of lucha libre, um, so cool. honoring the the people who made an impact. Um, you know the biggest names out there and kind of the the big moments. Like vampiro, like vampiro, that you get the opportunity of interview him. I know that who that was that was scary. Okay, so you talk <laughs> about something scary. That was a nerve wracking experience. I think I was more nervous interviewing Vampiro than anyone I've ever interviewed or announced. <laughs> you know, Vampiro, he's he's just you know he he beats to his own drum. He does his own thing. He he will tell you what he likes and what he doesn't like. So talk about research. I spent literally hours just listening into other interviews that he did to try and find what what to do and what not to do uh, because. I just didn't want to get into that pit hole of like saying something wrong and then like the interview go downhill because, you know, um, that that could absolutely happen with it. I, I heard it. He was it's nice. In life. He was. Yes, he really was. Um, I think uh, just because we got into the, the right topics uh, and, you know, I think we didn't have that much time. So I think if it would have gone longer, maybe. I would have tripped up on something and, and, you know, maybe agitated him. But, yeah, even seeing Vampiro and, and his story, that Lucha Central has been a really great uh, opportunity for me to just really learn and embrace Lucha Libre. Like, that is something that it's, it's you know, just part of a deeper culture and heritage. And I've always knew about it, but I didn't understand it. And now I feel like I understand it a lot better. Cool, cool. Geraldo. So other than ring announcing, you've done backstage uh, interviews too. So uh, what uh, have you learned uh, from the industry doing backstage, uh, backstage interviews that you didn't know before? I think that some of it is really um, how much that role with interviewing is about being a foil for whoever you're interviewing you know you almost have to think backwards a little bit with interviewing what not not is what is the question i'm going to ask is what is the end result of this interview what are we trying to do Mm -hmm. um and you kind of then work backwards to then think about okay what question do i ask in order to get to that end result 
Um, so if you're talking about, you know, putting over a match or putting over a person, um, you kind of then think, okay, well, how can I ask that? Uh, or or kind of what do I say? Yes, yes, absolutely. Cause and effect. And so usually you think about, okay, I'm going to ask the question and then get the answer. But in interviewing, for me, it's more about understanding what the answer should be and what it's meant to be and then thinking of, of the question. Okay. 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 So um, which of the wrestlers that you have interviewed left you what they call a starstruck? Like... <laughs> Oh, man. I, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about Tommy Dreamer already. I think that mm -hmm. one, Yeah, besides him, yeah. In a backstage interview. Um, man, I would say... Uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember anybody else that I've really interviewed that left me super starstruck. Um, trying to think. Other than people that I've already kind of, of mentioned... Um, I would also say someone that maybe not not solely interviewed, but uh, I had a good conversation with, and someone that um, I've always wanted to interview is Thunder Rosa. Uh, okay. She yes. So I met her in Tucson. She worked uh, with Cactus League Wrestling a few times, and um, I remember she was actually in a triple threat match and. Before I had to go to the, uh, you know, as, as I'm preparing my notes, you know, I had to go to her to kind of collect her information. Um, she was busy at the time, so I kind of left and came back. And it was kind of last minute moment, so I didn't get the chance to talk to her. After the show, we finally were able to talk a little bit, and I just got the chance to talk to her and, and let her know how much of a fan of hers I was, how I loved seeing her on social media. Um, this was last year when she got to share her journey about, you know, her citizen process and, um, mm -hmm. you know, just life as a mom and as a wrestler. And she's just someone that just speaking with very casually, I was a bit starstruck because she just was so easygoing, but so driven and uh, really like, you know, just has so much focus and passion. And you can see that. Uh, but she was very kind and, and sweet. And so just speaking with her in the casual element left me very starstruck uh, that you know it wasn't an actual interview uh but she was just someone and to see her now with everything that she's doing with the nwa and with aew doesn't surprise me at all and she's having an amazing year in a year where a lot of people struggle who don't have that platform um so she, it was really exciting to um to see her in in that format um and Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, a lot of people I've already mentioned, these were people that I loved and yeah, yeah. really left me starstruck. Um, I would say probably to a vampiro, some of it was nerves and a little bit too starstruck again, because two, we got to interview him uh, about his documentary, uh, Nail in the yes. Coffin. So not only was it feeling, seeing that perspective of, of him as a wrestler, but seeing his whole life, that too felt really personal that we all got to see that and you know, he shared all of that. So I was also nervous because I just wanted to be respectful of that element mm -hmm. of his life, that he took all that time to share it with us. And I just wanted to, to kind of honor and respect that from him. Um, and again, with, with us, with our team, he was really nice and, and um, great. So uh, yeah, luck, luckily, I, like I said, I had to do my research just to make sure though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did a good job doing that. Yeah. Oh my. Do you have any funny backstage story that you can tell us? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot. Uh, oh, man. Share something. Them, yeah, no, no. There's, uh, uh, there's a few. A lot of them, Albuquerque with Destiny Wrestling um, was the place that I started, and it's my home. You know, it always have a place in my heart where I feel like that promotion invested in me, gave me a lot of great opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it was some of the funnest times I ever, ever had. There's two wrestlers in particular, very different experiences, uh, but, um, you know, both fairly funny. Uh, and both I interviewed on my first night, and, and I kept on, you know, going with them throughout um, uh, my career there. 
Uh, one of them was a scary experience. His name is Johnny K. And he okay. was part of this trio called the Death Rage Cartel. And that kind of tells you a lot about him. He's almost this sociopathic, obsessive, creepy guy. And <laughs> he made it like his job every time he saw me to creep me out. And from day one, um, you know, he would get super close to me and kind of start whispering. And just, you know, he, he was just, just every element of creepiness and horror that he had, he would make sure I felt it. And he had uh, this um, companion called Baby, which was a plastic baby doll that he would carry <laughs> with him. Okay. And, you know, he would yell. Baby was mad at me. I said something wrong. And Baby was so mad at me. And, and I didn't know what to do because I'm this, I, I, he threw me off guard every single time. And like I said, he did it like it was his job to freak me out and to scare me. And, you know, like, and the fans then loved it. Like, they only wanted me and Johnny to have interviews. And I hated it because I'm like, I don't want, I could, I could have a heart attack right now. And the fans <laughs> wouldn't care because, it was gen you know, it, it was um, that always, always the, the element of fear came with Johnny K. On the other hand, there is another wrestler. He is like the little brother I, I knew I, I never wanted. Okay. Uh, a fellow Puerto Rican, Gino Rivera. Okay. And Gino does what Gino does best, runs his mouth. And his promos were out of this world of how ridiculous and insane they were. And he would use them to kind of belittle me, to make fun of me, to make fun of everyone. But they were so good, I wanted to laugh. I wanted to, you know, I, I just mm -hmm. couldn't help myself because he, he, he is very much a talker. And one time, uh, he, was, he made us all sing. He was singing, We Are the Champions, because he had this title. And he made us and this whole backstage crew try and sing this song. I'm trying to interview him, and he's just trying to, he's just singing. He's not even not even paying attention to what I'm trying to say. He's also gotten caught up in fights. Like, literally, he he used me as a human shield. So oh, wow. So someone else put in block. Yes, that was, yes. That's, he's, he's put me in some situations at Gino, you know, and, and, and I, I respect him as a friend, but he's put me in situations, yeah, where he <laughs> used me as a human shield so that someone else wouldn't beat him up. Um... And, and so, yeah, uh, there, there's just some kind of crazy things that's happened. A lot of times just people like to, like to poke fun at me, but I've either been scared or I've been, you know, <laughs> I've been used as, as a shield and made fun of and mocked. But that's just part of, of the job. <laughs> hey, thanks for sharing, <laughs> Geraldo. <laughs> so you're a big advocate of indie wrestling. So what do you think Nick's... Uh, needs to happen to motivate people to start support, supporting their local promotions more? That's a very good question because, uh, you know, there's so many fans that don't realize that there's promotions, you know, right in their city. Uh, mm -hmm. when I've always gotten confused. When I go to a WWE event, there's thousands of people. But when I go to an independent promotion, it's, you know, 30 people. And we yep. all love wrestling, but why are those same people who go to WWE not going to their local promotions? Right. It's cheaper, it's more convenient, it's shorter, you get to be more involved in a local promotion, like you get to be more face-to-face, -face. you get to cheer and boo, and, and it actually makes a difference. You know, the wrestlers get to hear you, you can actually have more of a role as a fan in an independent promotion. Right. So I think it's a mindset, too, of, of just being aware. I think fans should try and explore and research, you know, who, what are the local promotions in their area, whether it's a Facebook search or, you know, um, Wrestling Calendar is a great uh, website. Um, they partner with LuchaCentral.com, and they run their own website, but WrestlingCalendar.com is a list of uh, wrestling shows all over the U.S. and sometimes the world. Just That's going so nice. on the calendar. 
Yeah, it, it's great. Um, they've done a great job of collecting um, information of upcoming shows, and it's also a way where wrestlers can promote themselves. Um, you can put in your zip code, and it will show you wrestlers near you. So if you are a promoter or a booker or anybody in that side of the business, you can see which wrestlers may be near you, and you can kind of look at their profile and see if it's someone that you may want to reach out to. Um, but just, you know, learning about your, your local wrestling promotions and just going to a show. I know that's a lot harder now uh, mm-hmm. because there's no shows happening, but um, even going to their social media pages, a lot of them have old yeah. videos and content that you can surf and, and watch. Uh, a lot of them have YouTube pages and you can watch old videos. Um, you can kind of see when they're, you know, going up and, and running again and going to a live event. Like I said, I came late into the world of independent promotions. I, I didn't go to my first independent show until 2016. And I think my life would have been so different if I had never gone. If I had never gone to a Destiny Wrestling show, I know I wouldn't be here today. Talking mm-hmm. with everyone, being a part of websites, being a ring announcer. So, you know, for some people, it could be a gateway into working with a wrestling promotion. Behind the scenes, in front of the camera. You know, that happens very often. But it also could just be a chance to see a different side of wrestling and enjoy wrestling in a way that, you know, a lot of fans every week complain about what's on TV. They don't like WWE. They don't like AEW. They don't like Impact, whatnot. But, you know, fans have a lot more weight in what happens on a local level than they think. And they may find something they like at their independent promotion Mm -hmm. that they didn't think they would. And again, that interaction, I mean, literally, they are just feet away from, you know, from from the ring. And they get to see wrestling in a way that they've never seen before. It's so different going to a live show than you see it on TV. So I really encourage people just to give it a chance to just check it out, do a little of research. And, and mm. when you see a, a wrestling promotion running a show near you, take a chance. It literally, most of the time, it's only 20 bucks, you know. People spend more money on other things that they only use once or never use. Twenty bucks is such a good investment for a fun time. And, and you know, and you never know which known wrestler could be in that independent promotion. You know, for instance, last year, uh, right here in or- in Orlando, uh, the, the, there's this this company that is based from Puerto Rico, IWA. So they have the IWA Florida territory. So it it was an event in, like, in this small boys and girls club, a nice place, you know. I swear there was only probably 40 to 50 people, but the main event was Carlito Caribbean Cool versus Mecha Wolf. So those oh. two in a main event that they easily can go to a stadium or a coliseum or, or a, an arena filled of 10,000 people, they were in front of 50 people, and I agree with you. They were like five feet from me, and I remember I was taking pictures and I sent them to this guy. Hey, man, look, I, look how close Carlito was from me. So Yeah, and, and it was I, like in Puerto Rico that you are almost <laughs> with, with the wrestlers right mm-hmm. there. Yes, and I've seen the videos of shows in Puerto Rico, and it's so different, too. You know, they really are. They really have the fans up close so many times. The action spills out of the ring into the stands. You know, that, that too, is something that I, I love to watch when I get to see videos like that because that's, I mean, that that's more typical there. But at the same time, you know, in, in the States, you know, some promotions do that really well and some not, not so much. But you talk about, you know, people who, who you don't expect to be there. Destiny Wrestling, um, they had a, a very special event. They had uh, Eric Bischoff reach out to them nice. um, back in 2016. And he said, hey, you know, can I come and, and watch your show? And they said yes. They didn't tell anybody that he was going to be there. So when they brought him out during a show, it was the shock of their lives that Eric Bischoff came out uh, at that show. So I, I agree. You know, most of the time they'll promote, you know, big names that are coming. But at the same time, every so often you get a surprise just like that. Um, I was also at Cactus League when they did their anniversary show when Big Cass came. 
And that was a surprise as well. Not really, no one really knew that he was coming. And I remember that that surprise of the mm-hmm. fans seeing him there too. So every so often you can get a, a fun surprise going to a show. And even if it's just, you know, maybe not a surprise person, but a match you didn't think you would like, or, you know, a, a person that you ended up really liking because they're an amazing wrestler or a funny performer or a badass, like, you know, I, I always see people, eventually when you get to a local show or independent promotion, you always leave remembering somebody, you know, someone that you came in not knowing, mm-hmm. but you leave thinking, wow, that guy was really cool, or that girl was great, and I really like her now. So even that, I think, is worth the price of admission. You know, I think us, you know, that we live in Puerto Rico probably most of our life, I think we were very spoiled. Uh, I don't know what, what do you think, Gerardo, because uh, in Puerto Rico, we always have uh, wrestlers from the U.S., you know, top, for instance, IWA, when they started in 99, the, their first events, probably 60% of the wrestlers came straight from WWF. It was, I don't want to say it was like a development territory, but I, indirectly, it was like that. And, and, and in the 80s, in the 90s, you know, the, you know, Puerto Rico have major events, but not, but in other events that they were not that big, they always have these uh, overseas or the U.S. Uh, wrestlers, you know, and, and so us were very spoiled to to have, you know, that type of, of, of special wrestlers, you know, by the time. And, and and like you were saying, and you were talking when you were, did you watch clips from Puerto Rico wrestling? Yeah, uh, the, the the interaction with, with us, the crowd, it was so close. They can start wrestling in front of us. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you can see Mr. Perfect fighting with Carlito Caribbean Cool when he was young. Uh, like like in front of you, and you say, hey, the man is very big. <laughs> and, 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 and you can see um, the ex, uh, Road Dog and Billy Gum right mm-hmm. there. You you can see the Hardys, you can see yeah, they go to a the lot of wrestlers. To- <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, it is a, a Puerto Rico ha, is ha, is a different experience. You know, uh, a lot of wrestlers that go to Puerto Rico, they feel that they have to go there to achieve some kind of goal because yeah. the, the it, crowd it, is is very difficult. It's hostile. Yeah. It's a hostile crowd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they will let you know. You know, in, in if the, you are in good, the... you are good. But if you make a botch, <laughs> they are gonna be laughing and mm-hmm. and throwing <laughs> things to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> So it is kind. Of, it was kind of cool. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions. You know, you as a fan, uh, for instance, uh, in your opinion, uh, what which are the top five wrestlers in the U.S. to you? Wow, that's a really good question. It's very that kind of hard because mm-hmm. I see so much wrestling mm-hmm. that it makes it you know. It's hard to narrow down, um, so I'll try and kind of pull things from different promotions um, and for different reasons, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm course. very much drawn to personalities and storytelling. I appreciate and love athletic ability, but I'm usually going to pull for people that I think capture my interest and that make me want to watch TV. Um, and so one of the people so far recently two that I really like watching and I think is very intense is Eric Young um, from Impact Wrestling. Mm-hmm. I think that ever since he's come back to Impact Wrestling, um, he's had this whole personality and attitude change that has been so fitting for him. And now he's the Impact World Champion and he's really carrying this storyline between him and Rich Swan for Bound for Glory. I think that uh, I'm way more interested in Eric Young than I am Rich Swan, and I just think it's because there's this intensity with him, and if you see some of the Bound for Glory promos with Eric Young too, they kind of play on him kind of having this split personality or, or you know, the fact that he has these two sides. Eric Young, the person that we saw back in Impact many years ago, was nothing like the person that we have now, and I think he's doing some really, really great, strong heel work. And his performance in the ring continues to be amazing still. Um, mm-hmm. I also have to put out uh, another person very close to, to me. Not very close. I've, I know him and I've announced for him. But I'd love to see his him continue to grow as Chris Bay 
um, in the X Division of, of Impact Wrestling. He mm-hmm. is someone who signed just earlier this year and really made a big splash. Um, he has, of course, the athleticism that's out of this world, but a personality and attitude that is so slick and so cool that I wish I was that cool. Like, he just makes uh, every every opportunity that he's on the screen is you know, just very flashy and amazing, and I really, I really like it. Um, another personal favorite of mine, like literally personal favorite, I do love him, is Finn Balor. Uh, I just think that oh, yeah. uh, he's just one amazing, and and yes, yeah, so he's he's maybe good looking. I haven't noticed, you know, I'm a <laughs> professional. I, I keep my eyes on the product, um, but. <laughs> Especially after the match this past week at NXT TakeOver 31 with uh, Kyle O'Reilly, uh, I think it really solidified him as, you know, the the dominant champion, one, one of the most dominant champions in WWE right now, mm-hmm. that NXT is the place for him. But we've seen him, I mean, from, you know, the, the biggest stages of WWE, from his time in, in Japan, really, I mean, there's nothing he can't do. And though his personality is more subtle, his performance in the ring is is ridiculous. And he can play, you know, he can really offset and play on his personality, whether it's an intense or maybe just calm and collected, maybe the demon, you know, those are all things that he can continue to to pursue. But uh, I just, I really enjoy watching his matches and I think he's in the perfect place in NXT. Um, kind of another just personal favorite of, of mine is Santos Escobar right now. I think talking about mm-hmm. beautiful representation, beautiful character, beautiful performance, this evolution of Santos uh, away from Hijo de Fantasma to Santos Escobar, at first I was a little skeptical. His name is Santos Escobar. Like, what are you trying to do, NXT? But the, the rest of the presentation of him has been really great. Um, I really enjoy Leal de Fantasma as a trio, and his personality, again, is so slick and somewhat calm, yes. but I loved how they brought everything together. Like, it's really, it's really entertaining. It's really fun to watch. Um, and then kind of my wild card, the random one, is Orange Cassidy. I really... I really like that mix of, you know, I, I really like seeing him grow, too. And maybe that's kind of a key for me, a little bit of evolution. He's always going to be the guy with his hands in his pockets and, you know, very laid back. But I really Geraldo like is, is a fan of Orange Cassidy, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I've, been a fa- I've been a fan since the Indies. And a lot of people, when he first appeared in AEW, would tell me, ah, oh, no. And I'm like, dude, give him a break. Like, yes, uh, yes. Give yeah. him a break we, and, we, are, and, we are some people of that one that you're telling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, he'll surprise you because I, I've seen his work in the Indies and I knew that if they gave him the chance, he, he would make it happen. So, and he's, he, he, it he happened, hasn't, it happened. <laughs> he hasn't proven me wrong. So, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think, especially what the work he did with Chris Jericho recently has shown him that, that he can wrestle, he can go, and he can still be himself. Um, mm mm-hmm. So actually have good matches and, and be part of good programs. So that's kind of off the top of my head, some of my more kind of random picks. But th- those are all people that when I'm thinking about who I want to watch on TV, you know, those are people that I get drawn to. And after that, if you would have to choose your Mount Rushmore, uh, uh, what wrestlers would you choose? Yes. This is actually good timing because I, I worked with one of the other podcasts on the Chair Shot Radio Network, the Badlands, and their whole podcast is all about um, Mount Rushmore's. So every week they do a new topic of Mount Rushmore's of something. But every time someone comes on, they also ask them for their Mount Rushmore. So I've just, luckily, this is a good question because I just. I just prepared it in my head not too long ago. <laughs> cool. And it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise to anyone, you know, from what I've been talking about uh, just in, in my fandom and, and history with wrestling. Of course, the number one for me is Stone Cold, my favorite, favorite of all time. Um, mm-hmm. I would also put The Undertaker. He is one where um, he's revolutionized wrestling, not only behind the scenes or in front of the camera, but behind the scenes. 
there's so many people that talk about the influence of the undertaker and his role in the back of really being mm -hmm. someone that people can go talk to and someone who's kind of laid out the, the law of the land and someone that people could rely on. And I think that helped set the tone and help change wrestling in ways we don't understand as fans or, 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 you know, I think there's so many things that his career implies that I think we just, you know, just the tip of the iceberg with him. But again, having one of the longest reign careers uh, within the WWE and everything that he's done is mm -hmm. the reason why we get to have dark characters and, and kind of mystery in wrestling is, it, I think is a lot because of him. Uh, I also say Ric Flair. Uh, he is someone that I got to know more in the 90s, so I, I had to go back to a lot of his work in the 70s and 80s, but he is the king of the modern athlete, almost. When you think about how basketball players and football players and every, you know, even just anyone in, in uh, sports has this luxurious lifestyle, a lot of that, I think, came from Ric Flair and, and just him being very flamboyant about, you know, being jet riding, limousine riding, you know, mm -hmm. and dealing, all of that, like that, that set the tone for, I think, people who, it was okay to be greedy. It was okay to want to be, you know, living a luxurious life. It was okay to want to do that. But he also, you know, lost a lot too. Like the the whole dynamic of Ric Flair doesn't quite make sense sometimes, but I love it still. And I, and I appreciate everything that he's done for the business. And then um, The Rock. Uh, he was someone, again, as I was growing up, in, in comparison to Stone Cold, very different, but still very like I would gravitate towards him because of the way that he was on the mic. He could do things that no one, I think, still hasn't been able to do as far as, you know, uh, the way that he would move in the mm -hmm. mic, but also the way that he could do cut a promo, the things he would say that wouldn't make any sense, but yet, you know, crowds would chant them. And uh, I've always appreciated how much he still acknowledges wrestling as part of his life, as his history, his family, all of that. Um, and I think wrestling gets at least some positive recognition because of that tie to The Rock. And there's still kids, I don't know how, they don't realize that The Rock was a wrestler at one point. He does look very different, like completely, completely different. Oh, yeah. from what <laughs> but they don't realize that he was a wrestler. And so, you know, but there's always that positive association, I think, of, of The Rock and, and wrestling and you know, makes it a lot easier to be a fan when people can kind of say, oh, yeah, I know, I, I know The Rock. I used to watch him and um, all of his stories, too. I think one of my favorite programs with him and Mick Foley, I think Mick Foley would be kind of up there as well for me. Um, the Empty Arena match was one of my favorites of all time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could just do anything. He literally has been in front of the biggest crowds in the world and also with no crowd and still be amazing. Yeah, I agree with you, Omar. Uh, if you have a dream match as a ring announcer, uh, what will be that match? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, because. But if you have more <laughs> than one, that you can tell us. <laughs> more than one. Well, you know, talking about um, you know someone that I, I would really like to, to interview. I have announced before, but seeing so much of that uh, already. Um, Uh, on AEW, Thunder Rosa with some mix of Diamante and Eva Lise, you know, that uh, announcing for like that would be amazing. Right. Uh, I really liked that story and that work on AEW. I think it's one of the better things that AEW has done. Um, and, uh, you know, that one would just kind of send chills up and down my, my spine to uh, announce. Again, I don't, I, I would. You know, I wouldn't uh, have a preference for over either Lisa or Diamante. I think both of them, either one of them would have a fantastic match uh, with Thunder Rosa. But that, too, would just give me all of the, the chills in the right places and all of the excitement that I would want to have um, as an announcer. And especially just for a women's match that has, has really helped AEW. Um, mm -hmm. like develop and hone in on, on their women's division. And again, Thunder Rosa is having one of the best years of her career in a time where no one thought that they could, you know, uh, salvage this year uh, because of, you know, not running and, and so many challenges. And so I, I would love an opportunity for that kind of 
mix of announcing that yeah that would be a dream for me okay you know and and talking about you know woman division right now do you have a top five favorite wrestler wrestling right now you know wrestler for the woman division at this moment yes i do As i actually talked about this we did more champions i was actually i think two weeks on the hashtag miranda show we talked about active champions and, and the top five there mm -hmm. um so it was also good timing because uh And this is in no particular order, but again, no, I think highlighting some of the uh, women from the Impact Knockouts division, um, they have one of the best women's division of all of pro wrestling. And someone that I've really grown, grown fond of and I really love as a personality, but also as a wrestler, is Taya Valkyrie. Um, mm -hmm. She is so good to watch, and she is so good in the ring. Um, and I think that she's always been talented as a wrestler, but her time and impact has allowed her to have more personality and be more playful. And to me, that's just something I really look forward to watching every week. Um, but that's a, a, another element of her. She could go in the ring with men, with women. You know, I mean, she could do amazing things. But now she's even just funner to watch because you can see aspects of, you know, just who she is as, as mm -hmm. someone, you know, um, you know, glamorous and someone who's a prima donna and someone who, you know, is all about her. But you also get to see aspects of her when, you know, she's with Rosemary and, and that friendship. And so I, I really like seeing kind of that development and growth. Um, but someone I really turned to uh, as of NXT TakeOver 31 is Io Shirai. Oh, she yes. She's great. I would almost say flawless. Like, Io does things that, I, I mean, her performance inside of the ring is fantastic her promo abilities have grown so much and she is just in the perfect role right now in nxt and seeing her against candace loray was amazing like that that match in and of itself i just saw eo's performance was was flawless i mean she did all mm -hmm. of the i agree with you i really really liked that match and i'm 100% sold on on Io Shirai. Um, a kind of a long term fan favorite that I've really liked is Bailey. I've been a Bailey fan since NXT. You know her her whole story with Sasha and uh, NXT Brooklyn. That is my favorite women's match of all time. That is the my the match I will sometimes just out of the blue go ahead and, and watch because it is the perfect elements of storytelling of wrestling. And mm -hmm. the crowd is there. Like, it's, it's amazing. It really, really is. And it's just one of my favorite matches to watch out of, you know, out of nowhere. And, um, but I've loved this. It took me a while to get into used to this new Bailey. Uh, but I really, I really <laughs> do like this new version of Bailey. It took me a while. But I'm really excited like about us. her. Make us two. Make us four. <laughs> Like, yeah. like, <laughs> at, the, at the beginning, we didn't like that Bailey. <laughs> I, I did, yeah, I did not like it. I love old Bailey, you know. That was, she really tugged at my heartstrings. I loved the work that she did in NXT. You know, of course, it happens with, you know, people who move from NXT to Raw or SmackDown that their character kind of loses the momentum. It doesn't quite translate well, whatever it is. And so I'm really happy that she's found her footing a little bit more. And, um, you know, this is a, a Bailey that's just a lot more confident. And anytime someone evolves, it adds years to their career. Mm -hmm. So when the old Bailey eventually comes back, which it, somehow it will, uh, fans are going to be excited because yeah. allowed it to go away and, and now, you know, come, come back. Uh, I mentioned her several times throughout this Thunder Rosa. I mean, she yeah. is just one that I really... Again, personally enjoy, but I love seeing her matches. Um, I think what she did with uh, Sheeta at, uh, I think it was All Out, that was really a, a fantastic match. One of the best matches she's ever had. And we think, uh, we think that is one of the best matches of women in AEW, if it's not yeah. the best one uh, until so now. So far, yeah. Yeah, I agree with Omar. Oh, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. It's probably the best women's match they've ever had. Yeah. And, and probably will for a long time because, again, I think that it's still taking time for them to develop their roster. Um, and uh, it's going to be a while, I think, before we get on the same level as, I would say, NXT. 
Um, yeah. NXT is one where, um, you know, they they have consistently good women's matches. They have, I think, the best women in all of, of pro wrestling as far as we, physical ability. We also agree, and that is something that we tell in in almost uh, every NXT review. We yes. tell that the best woman roster in the whole wrestling business uh, is NXT. The other one is TNA, and and then uh, every part, but AEW is like the the last one. <laughs> No, you're right. I absolutely agree with that ranking. I absolutely agree. Though that's 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 the rankings there for me as as well. Um, and as far as number five, I'll probably go back to Impact uh, because I really like this person, kind of because it probably reminds me of Bailey is Kylie Ray. Yes, um, I Kyler. really like her. And again, she has an amazing ability, but I've really liked her personality. Um, And I think she's found a really good fit in, in Impact right now. I think a lot of the women on that roster are at the right place, you know. Um, I know that they brought in, say, Kimberly. They brought in Deanna. They brought in Kylie Ray, Tasha Steeles, you know. I mean, they brought in people, and they have a firm place in that company. And they're not lost in the shuffle. You know, where they end up going after this, who knows if they do or if they stay But the fact that they get to really focus on them and allow them to grow and allow fans to build this attachment to them. Um, and Kylie Ray, I know that at one point there was a lot, you know, people making fun of her and Bailey almost having the same character. But now that they're very different people, Kylie mm -hmm. Ray can, you know, monopolize on the smiling, hugging, friendly face uh, demographic. She she has it now. And I just I really like I really like her. So speaking about the the females, uh, Tessa is still a free agent. Where would you like to see Tessa next? Oh. Ooh, that's a really ooh, that's a good question because um, I would say I wasn't surprised, but I was a bit surprised uh, about her leaving Impact Wrestling. Um, I mean, I was there at uh, Hard to Kill when she won the World Championship. And at that point, it seemed like they were going to really move forward with her as as a world champion for some quite some time. And then, you know, things things happened. I think it, it will really depend on, mm. too, you know, how they utilize her, um, whether it's specifically in just a women's division or if maybe she could be the one person who, um, you know, could end up facing men. I think for just caliber wise of being able to compete with other women at her level it's nxt and we were just talking about it nxt is the best women's division of all of pro wrestling and i think that could really test her in ways that um we haven't seen um i mean the impact roster was great and she had some really great uh matches but no one was quite at her level wrestling wise Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at the landscape of pro wrestling, the only the only area that I could see having a high caliber of women that could compete with her is NXT. Um, but also you got to think about the long term, you know, it, it could be more about visibility and, and, and moving up in your career. And WWE could be great, you know, seeing her and Charlotte Flair in the same ring. And that that would be funny. every everyone yeah, wanna it, wanna it, see them. Well, a, a couple of months ago, we did this episode talking only about you know what we think of Tessa, what what company she should join, you know, and and you know there, there's reason that we can say AEW, but there's other reason that we can say WWE. You know, we are aware that the women's division. In, in NXT is the best one probably right now in the business uh, besides the ones in Japan for sure mm -hmm. but you know for storylines and for attraction wise you know you have Tessa and Charlotte two uh, daughters of the four horsemen and you can even have a program with Becky Lynch establishing who's the real man because I already beat men not like you you know you can't Mm -hmm. go to different routes you know you can even hire her for those two big matches and then she can do whatever she wants because in, in the other hand aw needs uh, 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 a female. In, in the roster and they're doing a good job you know you have thunder rosa going in you have diamante you have Ivelisse. that they're, they're helping to to get that division 
how about uh, like a, like a you know an upgrade so you can add Tessa, you know, and Wera Loca. I know she's good in Impact, but you never know, you know, if yeah, she ended up yeah. in in, in AW can help. But definitely, if you're gonna run a program with Tessa in WWE, you can start like going, okay, let's go to NXT, let's beat everyone, and then my focus is let's go over there and have those two women, you know, that that kind of track a WrestleMania, uh, yeah. SummerSlam, you know, event, you know. So yeah. And in NXT oh. will be a, a lot of good matches. Oh yeah, she with yeah. Yoshirai, with a Rhea Ripley, mm -hmm. with Candice Larey, will be a lot of good matches. And she will have a chip in her shoulder because uh, the May Young Classic. She was part of it, but she was yeah. not the the same Tessa that Tessa we're that seeing is now. Nice. So that she can go from that point on you know it will be very interesting what she's gonna end up doing she was training in 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 tijuana not so long ago with sasha banks i was i see some pictures yeah. of her so yeah. the, you know you never know <laughs> you never know and it, and of course you you know hear things about you know people trying to uh you know put put some good good vibes out there for her and, and, and trying to you know get her in conversations with other companies Um, and, and you never know. I mean, it does seem like at least the two big ones with WWE and AEW could easily stake a claim, but I think it, you're absolutely right. It's how you build the story around her mm -hmm. and, you know, what you do with her that's going to set it apart and maybe for her be the deciding factor of where she goes. Yep, yeah, I agree with you. Geraldo. So we're going to go to a section that y we usually do. It's called El Toma y Dame, which is basically our version of ping pong, which is uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a name and you're going to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, it could be a word or it, it could be a phrase. Okay. So let's do this. So the first one, mm -hmm. Greg DeMarco. <laughs> <laughs> Does that count? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's he uh he's he's my best friend. Uh but uh he's also a know it all. Okay. Yeah. Um, Brute sixty six. Freaking beasts. They are just beasts. <laughs> Rey Basura. Uh, uh, Ray Basura. He's the king. He, he's the, the trash king. That's <laughs> the, the first thing that comes to There you go. <laughs> the My bearded lady. lady. That's my girl. That's, that's, that's my girl. That's, that, that's, yep. She's a lady. That's exactly what you said. But she's, she's a, a good friend. She's a homie. Uh, and I love her. Tommy Dreamer. Legend. Legend. 100% legend. Stone Cold Steve Austin. The best of all time. Elite Wrestling Entertainment. Um, pass. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Destiny Wrestling. Oh, home. Home sweet home. The Sure Shot Network. Uh, the best. The best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> Cactus League Wrestling. Uh, the comeback. They're they're coming back. So watch out for Cactus League. The comeback. And last but not least, Miranda Morales. Uh, um, ooh, yeah. The Queen of Soft Style. There you go. <laughs> well, mm, gotta always plug the brand. Queen of Soft Style right here. <laughs> hey, Miranda, <laughs> uh, be, before we go and, and end up this episode, uh, we're going we're gonna to say thank you for spending this time with us. It was an honor. You know, we have some fun talking to you. If people want to know about more about you, uh, uh, what, you know, how they can reach you, you know, the social, your social media. 
Yes, so uh, I am not on Twitter, but you can follow at Chairshot Media. That is the Twitter that I sometimes take over uh, during NXT. Um, but you can find me personally at the hashtag Miranda on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm on there actively, and you can uh, send me a message. Uh, you can like a post. Uh, feel free to do that. But I'm at the hashtag Miranda on social media. And you can also follow the chairshot.com and luchacentral.com for the shows that I'm tag Miranda show and the Lucha Central weekly podcast. Um, they're both two great websites for wrestling news, analysis, and opinions. Um, and uh, also you can go to prowrestlingtees.com forward slash the chair shot. And there we sell t-shirts on behalf of the chair shot. This is one of them right now. There you uh, go. One of my favorite ones. And it is in soft style. Uh, so you can you know get it in a little bit more of a relaxed fitting. And also my t-shirt, the queen of soft style, is also on there. Um, and that's for wrestlingtees.com forward slash the chair shot. Mira, espérate un momento porque quiero enseñar algo. Es, es la única manera en que pueda hablar español, pero es algo Dime. que es, es enfrente de mi corazón muchísimo. Pero es un dibujo del viejo San Juan que tengo uh -huh. aquí. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that, a, that, that is that's our home. home. The three our of us were, were from old San Juan, so that's from that no place. Every, oh yes, no that place. Idea. That place was our house, and we uh, walked that streets <laughs> almost every day. Every day. Uh, and, yeah. and we can share a story with you uh, after we finish the episode. But yeah, no, no, I it give me goosebumps yes, seeing that. Yeah, that's our that's our block. Sí, es, es, es muy cerca de mi, para mi corazón y pues lo tengo aquí todos los días, uh, aquí en el the, the background y pues quería enseñarte porque... Gracias, es, gracias. Es, That was gracias. Gracias. From you. gracias. Es, oh, es muy especial que eh, hicimos esto y estoy uh, tratando de hablar español en, 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 y soy malísimo, pero es algo muy importante que quiero hacer con ustedes. Um, porque es, es algo que es, es para mí muy importante y sé, uh, yo sé para uh, los, los, los gente que está escuchando eso, esto que um, quiero uh, hablar contigo más, uh, uh, more, uh, en sí, español, sí. en el futuro, uh, pero, you know, uh, steps, little steps. Baby steps, uh, steps yeah. In the future, yeah. you you can be with us uh, talking about some event of wrestling, uh, like a per per view or we something like Spanish. that, and, and, and you can be there you. with all with with us talking about that event in Spanish. You can in Spanish. practice. Yeah, you us, can yeah. practice. Yeah. Oh, eso. Sí, puedo, necesito practicar mucho, pero es, es, thank you so much. <laughs> this means a lot that you uh, invited me to come on here. This was wonderful to talk with you, and, and it was very special, so thank you. Cool, cool. Uh, one last message that you want to say to the people that listen to Trifulca Wrestling or TWN, that what we call it now, TWM. Uh, yeah, thank you. Muchísimas gracias para that you're listening. Uh, to this, um, por favor, si quieres visitar, thechairshot.com, luchacentral.com, and si quieres, uh, you can follow me on social media, uh, y más importante, support your local independents. Yes, you know, important. Go make sure you check them out, support your local independent promotions, they need you now more than ever, um, so even if you buy a t-shirt, if you go check out their websites or their social media, Make sure you do that. If you're looking for a place to do that, go and check out the wrestlingcalendar.com. You can find all upcoming events happening and you can find out about very cool promotions in your area. Okay, cool. Well, bueno, gente, esto es todo. Así que de parte de Miranda, Omar, Geraldo y Alex, esto es hasta la próxima.